So I assume you guys can hear me and see my screen. All right. So let's talk about modeling spacecraft uh, separation dynamics. Um, so one thing I, uh, my name is Johnny Dugelman. I'm a guidance navigation control engineer at NASA, um, the launch services program in Florida. Um, so one thing I, I kind of wanted to talk about is, um, is uh, so we recently migrated one of our tools over from Simulink to Julia. And I, I really wanted this talk to be kind of a case study in um, tooling for engineering simulations. And, and one thing to pay attention to is, uh, uh, I wanted to highlight uh, how nice it is that um, the differential equations.jl and all the SIML tools just work with the entire Julia ecosystem. So that just opens us up to a broad uh, range of capabilities um, that we could just kind of pick pieces as we want and um, put them in place. Um, all right, so let's go. Uh, so brief overview, we'll talk about spacecraft separation, what the problem even is, um, how we model it. We'll talk about our current separation analysis tool in Simulink, um, the problems that we have um, with it and why we were looking for something different. Um, then I'll talk about a simulation I wrote in differentialequations.jl called Recursat, um, talk about its capabilities. And then finally, the more interesting part is, you know, I'll, I'll demo it a little bit um, with a typical design, type, design problem that we would be solving. Um, so you'll see some interactive parameter tuning, um, optimization under uncertainty, and um, auto diff um, and global sensitivity analysis. So let's talk about spacecraft separation. Um, this right here is a mission that I worked on recently. Uh, that is the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission. I was the um, GNC engineer for it, and I did the um, separation simulation um, and um, analysis for it. So one of the problems with uh, that, uh, so what that was a video of is a spacecraft separating from the upper stage of a launch vehicle. Um, so one of the problems you have is you have tight tip off uh, rotational rate requirements, um, usually a degree per second or a couple degrees per second. Um, and the reason for that is uh, a lot of spacecraft have to wait to turn on reaction control systems and they can't point sensitive equipment into the sun while they're waiting um, and they're just in a free tumble until then. Um, and they sometimes will have limited um, uh, ACS budget for detumbling um, because they're actually, you know, using gas to, to detumble themselves. Um, so uh, what kind of works against this tip off requirement is there will also be a requirement that the two vehicles have a minimum relative velocity so they don't recontact each other. Um, so, you know, the, the higher separation velocity you have, the more likely you are to violate your tip off rates. So it, everything's very sensitive to um, system parameters, spring constants, mass vehicle, uh, vehicle mass properties and such. Um, so let's just talk briefly about modeling. It's simple, rigid, rigid body dynamics don't really need to go to over the equations. Everyone kind of knows them. Uh, we use quaternions to update the attitude. Uh, forgive the abuse of notation here. I'm you know, pretending a quaternion is a four element vector. I know it's not, but that's how it's coded in the simulation because it makes it easier. Um, so our forcing functions are the more difficult part um, is you have things like the, the clamp band is the part that keeps the spacecraft and launch vehicle together. It's a, it's a ring around it and it releases, it imparts um, it imparts an impulse when it releases. And then it can also, um, as it separates around, it can kind of give a hinging moment. So you have to simulate that. Um, you have pusher springs, that'll be what actually pushes the vehicle off the um, spacecraft off the launch vehicle. And then there's various connectors, which connectors, which uh, provide some friction purge lines and electrical connectors and such. Um, so our current tool is uh, written in uh, a GUI based, you know, it's written in Simulink, so it's block diagram based uh, causal modeling language. Um, and we have a user facing input deck, um, which is a MATLAB script, so you don't have to dig into the simulation each time. The idea is you want to keep it pretty, pretty easy to um, set up new analyses every time. So the problem we had with it, for one, is it's just not very flexible. Um, it could only handle one uh, spacecraft launch vehicle separation, and there's a growing demand for CubeSats and other ride shares. Almost every mission we have going forward is wanting to include other secondary missions on it now, which we never had that in the past. 
Um, and, and it's really hard to have something like that in a language, in a GUI based language like Simulink, because how do you just handle arbitrary configurations? It, it's, it's a tough problem to set up. So another problem is handling derived dispersed parameters. And this one's a little more subtle, but it's important. Um, so the Monte Carlo dispersion draws happen after the input deck is read in. Um, so the problem with this is, let's look at an example. It'll hopefully make it more clear. Let's say you have a vehicle dry mass that's normally distributed um, and a, the propellant mass inside of it is you know, uniformly distributed. Well, your simulation doesn't actually care about either of those. It just wants to know the mass. It's just treating it as a lumped mass. Well, now you need to, if you want to disperse those parameters and, and handle them correctly, now you need to add um, stuff into your input deck and the input parsing function just to be able to handle that. So it really leads to this explosion of complexity, which leads to the next problem, um, is that it just gets really complicated for what should be a simple simulation. Um, your input deck, um, it, it's over a thousand lines of MATLAB code, um, which for some projects wouldn't be that much, but if you, you need to turn around analyses, you know, within a, a couple of hours or something like that, that it's pretty uh, prohibitive and it's error prone. Um, did you remember to set every parameter you needed over those thousand lines? Did you remember to unset parameters from other things that you didn't need? Um, it's just, it's not great for that. Um, so it really prohibits quick turnaround analyses and uh, it's a high learning curve for, especially we, we get in interns a lot and new engineers and stuff. And this is supposed to be the easier stuff that we do. And this is usually a task that we could give to them, but even so just the tooling around it makes it very difficult to teach. Um, so and the biggest problem is that it's slow. It's about 15 minutes for you know, 514 Monte Carlo runs. That was our last analysis, did that many. Um, and the typical argument is you know, engineering time is expensive, compute is cheap, so don't really worry about it. Well, the problem with that is when it takes engineering hours to iterate with slow tools, all of a sudden compute becomes expensive. Um, so you know you, you end up spending hours debugging something that should be a 15 minute turnaround, maybe a little more than that. But um, another problem is you can't interactively explore things, parameter sensitivities, design trade-offs. And if you wanna optimize under uncertainty, it, it's just, you know, that's, that would just, it takes too long to really be reasonable. So let's talk about the, the tool that um, I developed in Julia for uh, solving these problems. Um, so let's go over the design first. Is it's um, it, it's a recursive design. That's how it's able to handle you know arbitrary configuration. So walk through the algorithm really quick. Is forces and inputs. Uh, the forces um, are calculated from the parent separation system. In this case, it doesn't have one. It's the parent vehicle right there. And then the function is called on the children. And then the forces are calculated for that child. Um, it does have a separation system, and then it calls uh, the function on its children, forces are calculated, calls on its children, this one doesn't have any children, so it goes to the next step where it uh, um, updates the vehicle's equations of motion with those forces, and then it passes back the equal and opposite forces to the parent, equations of motion, equal and opposite, equations of motion, and then there's no parent to pass back to, so you um, take the update step, um, you increment your time step. So the requirements we had for it um, were we want it to be efficient and we want to run hundreds, if not thousands of Monte Carlo runs in under a second, because you want to be able to interactively explore things, which sounds like a tall order coming from 15 minutes before, but you'll see. Uh, we want it to be able to compose with the rest of the um, Julia ecosystem. So if you want to auto diff through it, great. Um, that, that's something we wanted um, just as flexible as possible. Uh, we want it to be universal um, to be able to handle any kind of mission um, and reasonably simple. We don't. We want it to be a simple uh, input to set up. Um, and of course, because it's NASA, NASA it has to have an acronym because that's, I guess, what we do. And because it's a recursive tool, I made it a recursive acronym. Um, so let's talk about the uh, fulfilled requirements. So it is uh, universal. Uh, the recursive structure really allows for the equations of motion to be written for really arbitrary configurations, which is great. It's pretty simple. This is the entire input deck um, now going from a thousand lines to this on the right. I can fit it on one slide. I mean, it, it's a little more complicated if we wanna add some more um, umbilical connectors and stuff like that, but this is kind of the general 
set up. Um, so instead of having a static input deck um, that grows in complexity, you import your types and functions, you only specify what you need, and there's doc strings right there in the REPL for, that'll tell you what to do. Um, and the nicest part about it is um, that it's really composable with the rest of the Julia ecosystem. Um, so for one, we use component arrays, it's a library I, I wrote. So the idea is you have these arrays with complex nested structures like this one on the right, and it can just pass right through a differential equation solver or an optimization solver. Um, so this is what our um, initial conditions look like before they go into the solver. Um, and it allows, it, what's really nice is it allows for like modular design that you would usually get with a modeling framework like Simulink or um, Modelica or something, but you don't need to have it. It's just a regular differential equation solver. So um, another thing is Monte Carlo measurements we use. Um, it's random variables that propagate uncertainty. And this really solves that problem, that dependent parameter problem I was talking about, because you set up your inputs and you could add together uncertainties. You could do whatever you want with them. And then right before we go into the equation solver, we turn it into an ensemble problem. Um, uh, you could pass these through a differential equation solver. It works perfectly fine. The problem is it doesn't interact um, with conditional statements in the way that you would really want. So we do unpack them before we send them through. So another thing we use is Unifold. Every input we use has to have, um, requires physical units. Um, and uh, this is important for us because we work with um, both European and American contractors all the time. And sometimes even in the same document, we'll have empirical, imperial and metric um, units. And it's just, it can be a mess if, if, if you're not careful about that. So this require, this makes sure that people are putting in correct units as they do. So we have global sensitivity analysis is, you know, one aligner. Um, both forward mode and source to source automatic differential equation, which are, um, but work with it, um, gives us local sensitivity analysis and makes it easier to um, optimize designs and optimization under uncertainty for robust design with DiffEQ uncertainty and Optum. So yeah, let's talk about efficiency. Um, the important part is we're under uh, 60 milliseconds for that same set of runs that took 15 minutes in our Simulink tool, which uh, was pretty amazing to us. It's you know, that 15,000 number doesn't matter as much as just the fact that it, it's very, very fast now. And we're still incorporating some features. Maybe maybe it'll take twice as much time when we're done, but even so that's great still. Uh, so yeah, let's actually get into the demo is kind of the more interesting part. Um, let's look at a kind of normal, uh, typical analysis problem we have. We have requirements um, less than a degree per second rotation rate in all spacecraft axes and greater than 0.55 meters per second relative velocity between spacecraft and launch vehicle. And we simulate it. And this little 3D thing that's from meshcat.jl, you know, it's really easy to just throw, throw the results in there and, and get a 3D um, visualization. Um, so we see in the top right, uh, we're not meeting our y-axis tip-off requirement. So let's uh, talk about some strategies to mit mitigate that. Um, so one we would do is add a uh, ballast mast inside the spacecraft. Um, so here's our free variables and constraints, your um, certain mass constraint, and then you have a positional constraint of where it can be inside the spacecraft. Um, um, and we have to make sure we don't add too much mass because that'll bring down our separation velocity and, and below the requirement. So here's one thing that's really cool is now, because the tool is so fast, if you want to just manually look at parameters, you could do that. And I think one of the things is um, you tend to think of, you know, going straight to optimization or sensitivity analysis, but a lot of times for engineering, it's more important to actually get a feel for how, um, how your system behaves and be able to interactively explore it um, like that. And that's just, it, and it's um, almost, more important sometimes than getting the you know correct answer or something. So this being able to run simulations this fast and looked at, and this is all real time, um, is incredibly helpful for engineers. Um, optimization under uncertainty. One of the cool things I wanted to highlight here is that component array type I showed you before that has you know the kind of structured input or whatever. You could send that through an optimizer, and it g gives you out the answer as that structured form. So um, it's cool that both the differential equation solver and the optimizer are written in native Julia. So you can just send the weirdest types you want through them and they come out correctly. 
And last, I, I just want to show uh, sensitivity analysis. Um, so on, on the left is a global sensitivity. It, it was a one-liner to set it up, um, get the partial correlation coefficient of the tip-off rates to ballast parameters. Um, super simple, like very little code to set this up. And then you could auto diff through it. Um, it is forward mode auto diff. It's literally just calling the Jacobian on the function and, um, and the optimal ballast parameters were um, looking at uh, about the optimal in this case. And I scaled it by the, the limit range because otherwise the, the CG swamps out the mass because the mass is just a totally different scale than the CG. So yeah, that's, um, that's really all I wanted to talk about today. If, if, if you have any questions, uh, let me know.